dear viewer, perhaps one of my students in the Animal Function and Environmental Adaptation course at the University of Linköping, we are going to be describing, or I'm going to be describing today, the circulation patterns in the, in the reptilian heart. And this is a follow-up on lecture number four, in which I presented the concept of shunts, cardiovascular shunts, as a maladaptive condition in relation to mammalian fetuses with congenital defects. What I'm going to be trying to prove here is that some of these built-in characters leading to shunt development are present in many other species that may have solved things differently or that could even take advantage of these shunting uh, patterns that uh, I describe as maladaptive, uh, maladaptive in mammals. And this is how I finished the previous lecture, which I certainly encourage you to look at, uh, describing the condition in reptiles, reptiles in which we have a rather important, remarkable variation in how this shunting, how this mixing between oxygenated and deoxygenated blood may take place. In the first place, we have turtles and esquamates, lizards and snakes, where we have an anatomically not divided, anatomically not divided ventricle and a functionally not separated, but we will see that there are some differences. This is what was considered once upon a time. So uh, we have a heart that is not fully divided and that allows, or it's, it's, it's a potential for mixing of oxygen and deoxygenated blood, shown here in blue and red, mixing up, taking place. And then looking at the other reptilian group, the crocodiles, in which basically this shunting or at least intracardiac shunting is no longer taking place because there is a ventricular septum formed between both ventricles. There is a st a still a degree of shunting uh, in extracardiac structures, but this is not what I will uh, be discussing in this lecture. In this lecture I will be considering the situation of chelonians, that means turtles, and esquamates, that means lizards and snakes how the circulatory patterns may affect or may hinder the possibility of being uh, mixing oxygenated blood and how that actually can affect their performance in different contexts. Taking a closer look at the two basic systems, what we see in on top here is a pattern with no division of the ventricle Nevertheless, there are two parts. This uh, ventricle is, is divided into two parts, separated by what's called the muscular ridge, abbreviated by MR here. So in all turtles, lizards, and snakes, this muscular ridge is present, delineating to cava, the cavum arteriosum, and the cavum pulmonale, and it's even described the cavum venosum. But they are still part of a single ventricle. And of course, what that allows is basically the mixing of blood because blood returning to the right atrium can well go into the pulmonary arteries, but can also go through uh, the left aortic arch or the right aortic arch in what would be denominated a right to left shunt that in the previous lecture I associated with a mixing of or a bypass of the lungs, therefore decreasing mass, uh, blood oxygenation. Alternatively, blood returning into the left atrium that would go through the right aorta can also be led to the pulmonary arteries. And this is simply because in the heart, the muscular ridge may not promote the separation between flows and then blood can cross from both sides and be emptied in equivalently one of these aortic arches, or the pulmonary artery or the aortic arches. The situation in crocodiles is very different because in crocodiles there's a formation of the ventricular septum separating both ventricles. What's interesting in reptiles, uh, or in crocodiles, sorry, is that the structure of the outflow tract is the same than in turtles, lizards, and snakes. 
and you, you see a, a pulmonary artery, a left aorta, and a right aorta. And the left aorta arises also from the right ventricle. Therefore, there is still a possibility of a shunt if blood is sent through the left aorta. There is a possibility of, of a shunt through the foramen of panizza. But again, I'm not going to be concentrating on this. This may be the, the, the topic of a future lecture, but not at present. So, clearly, we have a situation in which uh, a, a muscular ridge may delimitate different uh, compartments in the ventricle, but there is no anatomical separation, versus the, the crocodilian circulation with a fully developed symptom in which both parts are still delimitated. Nevertheless, shunting can take place. This is not the case in the mammalian and the bird heart where the left aortic arch does simply not exist. Let's look at some of the function uh, or, or some of the rec some recordings that have been made in, in, different, in different reptiles in trying to understand how this shunting takes place. And this is a particularly nice uh, study done by Tobias Wines and Jim Hicks in the red ear slider turtle. It's a complex slide, but basically what the two panels show are the responses in two different individuals, in two different turtles, and the recordings here show ventilation, a ventilation trace, and in this case it's indicating when the animal is ventilating. Remember that many reptiles, turtles in particular, are intermittent breathers, so in this case you see one breath or two breaths here, continued by another one, etc. In this turtle, you have a bout of breaths continuous, and then basically situation of apnea. We also have pulmonary flow, measurements of pulmonary flow, the, pul the, the blood flow in the pulmonary arch, measurements of systemic flow, in, the, in this case it would indicate the left aorta and the right aorta, measurements of heart rate, and then this has to do with the, flow, the, the net shunt flow, meaning how much of the blood flow is shuffled into the non-equivalent uh, non uh, side of the circulation. And finally, the ratio between pulmonary and systemic flow. Uh, when, when this pulmonary and systemic flow equals one, means that both sides are pumping, uh, are, are just both, both flows are identical. Notice that this never happens in these traces. Uh, the, Q, the, Q, the pulmonary to systemic uh, ratio actually is always below one, meaning that the systemic flow, as typically observed by many other researchers, is much higher than the pulmonary flow. In this graph, what we see is a clear prevalence of a right to, to left shunt because there is lower pulmonary flow than systemic flow, which means that the blood returning into the right atrium a big proportion of it is sent, instead of through the pulmonary artery, is sent into the left or the right aorta. Mm -hmm. This is a lung bypass, this right to left chunk is a lung bypass, and it impairs blood oxygenation. Notice very clearly also that despite the presence of this right to left chunk at all times, there is a decrease in the net right to left chunk during periods of ventilation. So when the animal ventilates, pulmonary flow increases much more than systemic flow does. Therefore, the shunt flow actually increases and that results in an increase of the ratio between pulmonary to systemic flow. So, when you have a situation in which there is always a shunt, a right to left shunt, this is a net shunt, in, in, in turtles with this type of recordings, unless uh, oxygen levels are recorded, it's not possible to distinguish the shunts that go across. So the net shunt, the total outcome of the shunting, is what we are describing here. The net shunt is of the R to L direction, bypassing the lungs, but that actually decreases during oxygenation. As a result, as a result, in turtles in particular, at least, what we have is a situation with a shunt leading to lower blood oxygenation. This right to left shunt would be similar to what I described in the previous lecture as a persistent ductus arteriosus, when after birth the ductus arteriosus does not close. 
therefore leaving again uh, blood uh, so no, that, that is probably wrong a persistent ductus arteriosus would lead systemic to that's a bad example would lead to systemic to pulmonary flow so it would be the opposite of what we are seeing here and then another important effect is the fact that there are common pressures in the outflow tract. Because both sides of the circulation, both outflow tracts are connected to each other in a single ventricle, it's not possible to develop differential pressures in both sides. That's what happens in mammals, that's what happens in birds. Pulmonary pressure is lower than systemic pressure. That's actually not the case in turtles. And then a common, typical measurement of pressure development in the right aorta, in the pulmonary artery, or in the cavum venosum, basically suggests that during systole, during the time that the heart is contracting, all these, all these locations have exactly the same pressure, have exactly the same pressure. This is an important detail that you see later, maybe different in other reptiles because there are exceptions this is a monitor lizard as described by Sir Richard Attenborough you may not hear what the film is saying but you can actually check it out in these directions here as well The monitor lizard is an endurance hunter that can chase the prey, and now you will see it running. cold-blooded monitor lizard can outrun the warm-blooded rabbit. Not all reptiles were created equal. And does that have any consequence? Or is that because of differences in circulatory patterns? You may guess that by now that the answer is yes, it is. In the monitor lizard, this is a lizard with a similar, a very similar heart structure than the turtle. The main difference being that the muscular reach is more developed, is larger than it is in turtles. And as a result of that, monitor lizards are able to functionally divide, to functionally divide the heart during systole. So during cardiac contraction, the muscular reach actually makes a complete separation of the ventricle into two chambers. This ventricle is not functionally separated, uh, it's not anatomically separated, but during systole it becomes so. And that excludes the possibility for mixing. That's what you see here. Red blood, oxygenated blood moving into the right and the left aorta, blue blood, deoxygenated blood moving into the pulmonary circuit. Now, if we look at this particular design, this is the, uh, what we will see is that unlike in the turtles, we have, there is a potential for pressure separation. In the left pulmonary artery, in blue, that coincides with the pressure of the cavum pulmonale. We have a much lower pressure than what we see in the cavum venosum 
and the left aorta. The right aorta would show a similar, a similar trace here. As a consequence, in this animal, because of the extension of the muscular ridge, a larger muscular ridge, separation during systole, and the possibility for actually two different pressures in the circulatory system. Is that functionally relevant? The answer is yes. Monitor lizards are able to perform an exercise to an extent that few other reptiles can. This is a result from study in which uh, monitor lizards were put on a treadmill and exercised there, reaching a speed of about 2 km per hour, and oxygen consumption was monitored. What you see is that basically there is a progressive, quite substantial increase of oxygen consumption from about 2 to 3 to 4 milliliters of kilo per minute up to a level of 16. So more than 4 to 5 fold increase in oxygen consumption, which is quite substantial for a reptile. This is coupled with a change in systemic flow. This is coupled with an increased performance of the cardiovascular the, of the heart to pump more blood at these higher levels of exercise. So what this is suggesting is that this animal takes advantage, benefits from the separation in the ventricle and that actually gives them this functional advantage showing how a monitor lizard could even outrun a rabbit and hunt and, and just chase it and hunt it. This was a picture until a few years ago, the consideration we knew that in most reptiles the non-separated ventricle led to the formation of shunts and then we knew that monitor lizards were slightly different, they could be functionally divided, they could actually perform better. So in this context, um, I was involved in an interesting discovery a few years ago, and that was uh, collaborating or actually working at that time. I was working at the University of Gothenburg with Michael Axis, a professor of zoophysiology there, and we had uh, Tobias Wang visiting from the University of Aarhus in Denmark, and what we were doing was using a setup that uh, Michael Axelson had put together to look at heart function in crocodiles earlier. And we were looking at the function of the heart of python snakes. This looks as a complicated setup. It is to some extent. But basically what we are able to do with this system is to try to imitate the conditions, the loading conditions of the heart in terms of input and output pressures in different sides of the circulation and manipulate them, uh, manipulate them differentially. So we are able to actually feed in and out of the heart uh, at the, against different pressures. Just to give you an example, these are the lines going into the heart and these are the lines coming out of the heart and pumping at a given uh, water height which is equivalent to an increased pressure. So with this system, we could take a look at how the Python heart is performing. And while doing these experiments, Michael Axelsen realized quickly that the Python snakes were behaving at least in a way that we were not, we had not predicted. And the non-predictive pattern here is that it seemed that the Python snakes were also able to functionally separate both sides of the circulation. How did we see that? Essentially, in our experiments, they're performing two different types of experiments. One in which we increase the pressure of the systemic outflow, outflow tract, that would be the right and the left aorta. And the other in which we would actually change the pressure in the pulmonary outflow tract. And what you notice here is that the, uh, the flow in the opposite side does not seem to be affected when performing changes in pressure. Therefore, when we increase the pressure in the systemic side, we see a drop in systemic flow, but very little change in pulmonary flow. And the same, to some extent, is seen in when it's pulmonary outflow uh, tract pressure that is changed. We were surprised by the results. We thought that they were very interesting. 
Looking at the muscular reach in the Python heart, we saw that it was a quite highly developed muscular reach. It's hard to see in this picture, it's a cross section. This would be the, the extension of the, of the muscular reach, it's rather uh, largely developed and formed. These results we published first in a paper in the Journal of Experimental Biology. And this study was followed by a second study, this one over here, in which we reasoned that if these results were correct, our expectation would be that in vivo we should see the same type of pressure separation that had been seen in the Varanid and the monitor lizard. And this is the, these are the experiments that we performed in order to show that. Essentially, I'm not going to describe this so much, this essentially indicates that when you affect pressure in one of the circuits, the other circuit is not affected, but I want to call your attention to these graphs here, in which what we see is the cavum arteriosum and the right aorta during systole have the same pressures, and the cavum pulmonale and the left pulmonary artery have also the same pressures. And these pressures are much lower than the ones in the right aorta. This is exactly the same picture that I was telling you that had been demonstrated and shown in the monitor lizard. So the point is that Monitor lizards may not be unique. A python snake can do the same. Why? Are python snakes particularly well known for increasing their metabolism, increasing their performance? Not particularly. But they are able to do it. In connection with the previous study I was describing to you earlier, the perfusion, the heart perfusion, we did not only perfuse snake hearts, we also perfused turtle hearts and varanid lizards. And this now gives you a more complete picture of what we were obtaining. Notice the big difference between the pattern in the turtle with both the varanid lizard and the python. These two species are much more similar to each other than they are to the red ear slider. Notice that in the slider, as soon as, in this case, systemic pressure increases, the flow in the systemic side drops, but the flow in the pulmonary side increases. So when resistance in one side is increased, in the other side it receives most of the flow. The same happens in the opposite side. This is not to the same extent, it, it's not happening to the same extent in the Python or in the Varanic Lisa. Combining these experiments, we also did another type of experiment in which we were clamping one side of the inlet to the heart. This would be the control scenario in which uh, both sides are, are, are perfused. What happens when there is a clamp placed on the systemic vein? Therefore, all the flow that comes to the, uh, the pulmonary flow will actually be showing mixing. Notice that the degree of mixing of systemic flow here is lower in our two species. These are the, sign, the, the symbols for the three species. The squares would be the turtles, triangles would be the python, and circles would be the varanid lizard. So what this data shows you is that basically there is much less of a degree of mixing in the python and the varanid hearts than there is in turtles. These results were unpublished for many years until very recently uh, a PhD student in, in Tobias' one uh, laboratory in Aarhus University finished this study because what uh, in this case uh, William Joyce did uh, was to now include two new species. We know the results of the python. He added a new python species showing exactly the same results we observed, but he also looked at anacondas. Notice what happens in anacondas. The pattern in anacondas, this X pattern, is much more similar to ha what happens in the red ear sliders. And he also took our varanid, or took the, the varanid data that we had generated years ago, and compared it with a new species, the bearded dragon. And again, here you see an X pattern. What's going on here is essentially a degree of mixing, the same that happens in the red ear sliders, the same happens in anacondas. Flow and pressure separation occur in monitor lizards, but not in birded dragons. They are both escomates, 
It also occurs in snakes of the genus Python. Now, we have shown it in two different species, but not in anacondas. And this is what we published recently, very recently, actually, in another uh, paper in the Journal of Experimental Biology. And the main conclusion from this is basically that it's the variable morphology of the muscular ridge that allows some species to keep two functionally separated uh, uh, circulatory systems, a lower pressure pulmonary circuit and a higher pressure uh, systemic circuit. Species with functional separation have a higher aerobic scope, that means their capability to increase oxygen consumption is larger, but unfortunately we don't know what they do with it. It's still unclear what selection pressures have driven the extension of the muscular reach in some species but not in others. We understand that uh, varanid lizards can use it because they have actually uh, better performance in terms of running, outrunning, other, uh, outrunning their prey. But why does it happen with python species? This is something that's still speculative and I'm not going to just uh, bring too many arguments there, but this is something that we are still trying to understand. And this is the end of this lecture. Thank you for listening.